National Gallery of Art, and he's working on his next project, which will look at the visual imagery of World War I. David's talk this afternoon is From Realism to Idealism, Bellows Goes to War. There, there are many bottles of water here. I don't know if they're all contaminated or if I can have one of them. Take your okay. Oh, and I, and I got my mic on, so I better speak more quietly. Use my, my, my inside voice, right? As my mother would say. Well, um, I'd like to thank Nanette Mesa Junis and Melissa Wolf and Mesa McClue and just the Columbus Art Museum for for organizing this great exhibition and for giving me a wonderful opportunity to come back to Columbus. I mean, I've been back since graduating from Ohio State, but um, it's just, it's really so exciting to be here and see the developments that the city has been going through and, and feeling huge pangs of nostalgia when I walk by certain places that I so love that now have huge buildings on top of them. And think, where do they go? Uh, okay, now I didn't know how to, is the first, when advances? Uh, yeah, the arrow will work. Okay, I was real, oh, I'll do it, I'll figure it out. Okay. I, okay. So at a meeting of the National Arts Club in New York City, now that Jennifer is here, I can begin. <laughs> at a meeting of the National Arts Club in New York City in 1918, the venerable printmaker Joseph Pinnell addressed club members on the topic of lithography. In his youth, several decades earlier, Pinnell had been a protege of Whistler, and from that master, he had learned not only the printmaker's art, but also the gentle art of making enemies. On this occasion, he took opportunity to abrade a rival 25 years his junior, the painter George Bellows, who had recently entered the field of printmaking with considerable success. The point at issue was authenticity. Pinnell insisted that artists should only paint or draw what they can observe in a direct face-to-face -face encounter. He denied that a true artist, quote, could ever, with any safety, see an experience beyond the actual fact before him, end quote. With this, Pinnell launched a swipe at Bellows, who was in attendance that evening. The older artist singled out Bellow's much-praised new oil painting showing the death of Edith Cavell, the British Red Cross nurse executed by a German firing squad in 1915. Bellows had based his painting on a lithographic drawing he completed several years earlier, several months earlier. Now, okay, okay, I gotta go forward. Okay, can I use this? I can just randomly press buttons and see what happens. It should be this one. Oh, that one. Go. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. I'm still back in 1960s technology, you know, now that I'm back in Columbus. They didn't have remotes back then. Um, okay, Bellas had based his painting on a lithogra lithographic drawing he completed several months earlier. Now, quote, if Mr. George Bellows, Pennell announced, had been himself present at the execution of Edith Cavell and had seen the whole thing with his own eyes, he would have painted a far more authentic picture than the one he made up out of his head. Now, before telling you what Bellows said in reply, I should point out that this was a very strange comment to come from Joseph Pennell who in that same year, 1918, produced what is certainly the most apocalyptic visual image to circulate in America during the First World War. Clearly, it too was a construct of the artist's imagination. It envisions a decapitated Statue of Liberty, her head lying half submerged in New York Harbor, while enemy warplanes bomb Manhattan into a seething cauldron of smoke and flame. Two million prints of the poster circulated throughout the land and seized Americans with dread and indignation at the almost inconceivable idea of an airstrike on Manhattan. 
No, Bellows replied to Pinnell, I was not present at the murder of Edith Cavell. Neither, so far as I have been able to learn, was Leonardo present at the Last Supper. <laughs> now, the appeal here is to a higher order of representation than mere eyewitness literalism. Bellows' supporters cheered his witticism, which was much repeated, because it linked their man to the great Renaissance master, who was at once a careful scientific observer of natural phenomena and an inspired visionary, one who never allowed the limitations of time and space to rein him in. There's something theological about Bellows's remark, and not simply because he alludes to the most famous religious painting in Western art. The theology inheres in the romantic view that the inner eye can see reality more clearly than the outer one does, that artistic inspiration trumps empirical fact gathering, and that in the making of true art, neither the hand, nor the eye, nor the brain of the artist ranks as high as the heart. That Bellows and his admirers would have take, would take in, wait, sorry, the Bellows and his admirers would take to this lofty ground in the face of Pinnell's criticism is nonetheless surprising. Bellows, after all, more than any other American artist of his era, was celebrated for his skills as a visual journalist, an eyewitness reporter of the seamy side of life, as seen, as images, as seen in images such as these, one of which shows three homeless men inspecting a scrap of food retrieved from a garbage can, the other execution by a recently invented technology of state-dispensed death, the electric chair. His most famous boxing picture, Stag at Sharkies, from 1909, makes a direct allusion to his self-appointed rule as an eyewitness. It shows the head of the balding painter on the lower right side. I don't know if this is a, well, okay. That's him beneath the arm of the referee peering over the edge of the ring. The position, this position suggests an analogy between two types of canvas, that of the fighters and of the painter. Indeed, the self-portrait serves as an artist's signature and proudly declares, oops, um, well, I guess I took that slide out. Okay. Um, Indeed, the self-portrait serves as an artist's signature and proudly declares, I was there. I saw this event with my own eyes. In the days before World War I, Bellas was America's core bay, a sharp-eyed observer of working class life and labor who had no truck with sentimental bourgeois idealism. Here I am comparing core bays, the Stonebreakers from 1849 with Bellows' Blue Morning from 1909, an ethereal and yet gritty depiction of manual labor during the construction of a railway station. When asked to paint an angel for a mural in a church, Courbet had facetiously replied, I have never seen an angel. Show me an angel and I will paint one. In principle, Bellows agreed. In 1918, however, he changed his mind about such matters and with Edith Cavell, he painted his angel. His nation at war, he turned to a different 19th century master for inspiration. He exchanged Courbet for Goya, adding, as the Spanish artist did, elements of the fantastic to his depiction of modern life. And I show you two Goya images. Especially because Bellows did not have the opportunity to see the fighting in Europe firsthand, he was compelled by circumstances to forsake the eyewitness ethos. He did, after all, make an effort to join the army and see action at the front, but at 36, he was rejected because of his age. Unable to bear arms against the Germans, he fought them with pen and paintbrush instead. His change of heart with regard to the war, as well as to his role as an artist observer, shocked some of his associates. We can understand this when we consider his earlier political leanings after leaving Columbus for New York in 1904 to seek his fortune as an artist, Bellows had embraced the Greenwich Village version of socialism and anarchism that historians have dubbed 
the lyrical left, a version of leftism congenial to artists, poets, and professors. The raw, muscular, energetic brand, we keep using that word here, somewhat in quotes, the raw, muscular, energetic brand of urban realist painting that Bellows perfected was an amalgamation of Courbet, Manet, and Jacob Rees, the turn of the century documentary photographer of New York City's poor. Here, along with two photographs by Rees from about a decade earlier, we see, oops, we're overactive thumb. Um, we see 42 kids and cliff dwellers. The young artist's visual verve perfectly suited the lyrical left. The house organ of the lyrical left was a lively and controversial illustrated monthly magazine called The Masses. It featured art, poetry, fiction, and political reporting by the era's leading left-wing artists, intellectuals, and activists. As seen in the cartoons and covers by him that I assembled here, Bellows was among them. When hostilities broke out in Europe in 1914, the magazine unleashed a torrent of editorials, cartoons, and opinion pieces denouncing the imperialist origins of the war and ridiculing the self-righteous bankers, clergymen, and press barons on both sides of the Atlantic who profited shamelessly from the war's continuation. Now, these are cartoons by other artists besides Bellows, but I sort of give you a sense of the masses position on the war, circa 1915-1916. Although Bellows, unlike many of his fellow socialists, did not actively oppose U.S. intervention in the conflict, he worried that it would lead to the curtailment, if not downright suppression, of domestic civil liberties. Still, I think it's safe to say that during the build-up to the war, and even in its first days, Bellows was not a super patriot. In this, he was quite unlike the pro-war activist child Hassam, who together with the aforementioned Joseph Pinnell, hailed from an earlier generation and a more privileged social class. And like Pinnell, he was Bellow's artistic uh, nemesis. Here I show you Hassam's 1917 Impressionist painting, Early Morning on the Avenue. The avenue in question being Fifth Avenue at 54th Street with flags of the Allied nations dancing beneficently across the skyline. Hassam's uptown views of Manhattan are altogether different from those of Bellows, such as New York, from six years earlier, 1911, which is upstairs. Bellows' depiction of a downtown square is dense with crowds, thick with pigment, laden with atmosphere. The paint handling, like the mean streets it depicts, is rough, muscular, and abrasive. Bellows insists on the multi-class, multi-ethnic, multi-layered nature of New York, and by extension, America itself. Hassam's intent, much the opposite, is to celebrate unity, homogeneity, and social order. Indeed, early morning on the avenue, painted at the dawn of America's entry into the war, could even be understood as a retort against Bellows' 1913 painting, Cliff Dwellers, where it's not ceremonial flags of America and its allies that snap in the breeze over the head of pedestrians, but rather the laundry of immigrants from around the world. Hassam, who was a staunch preparedness advocate, began making patriotic paintings in 1916, about a year before America went to war. Bellows, at that time, treated warmongering satirically. A drawing that he first published in a New York West Coast, in, in, sorry, in a West Coast anarchist magazine and then sent to the masses for wider circulation depicts Jesus as a convict. Leo showed this this morning. Manacled, clad in prison, in prison stripes, bound by ball and chain, the Prince of Peace has been jailed for preaching the seditious words, thou shalt not kill, during wartime. Christ in Chains, as this drawing is called, appeared in the Masses issue for July 1917, which was prohibited under the newly legislated Sedition Act from being circulated by mail. And that, in fact, closed down that magazine, the Masses. This blockage, uh, yeah, I was going to say, this blockage eventually resulted 
in the demise of the publication. And several of Bellows's fellow artist illustrators were threatened with prosecution for their more incendiary imagery, including these uh, two cards, by, uh, cartoons by Boardman Robinson and I think it's Henry Glinton Camp. Um, Bellows, however, was not threatened with jail time, nor was he radicalized, as were other members of the lyrical left, by the heavy handedness of the wartime government. To the contrary, he became increasingly pro war in his attitude, outraged, enraged by reports of German atrocities that streamed across the Atlantic. In keeping with his commitment to artistic activism against cruelty, corruption, and injustice, as seen in the numerous political cartoons and social satires he had contributed over the years to the masses and other leftist publications, he felt the need to take a stand. In doing so, he broke ranks with his anti-war comrades, some of whom never forgave his apost apostasy and declared his support, um, he declared his support for American intervention. It was at this point that he volunteered for combat service and was turned down. His subsequent campaign of art against the enemy is extraordinary in its ferocity. With Goya's early 19th century series of etchings, the disasters of war as his model, and this is Goya, from Goya, he feverishly churned out a series of lithographs that describe in ghastly detail the German army's march through neutral Belgium in late summer of 1914, raping, pillaging, and torturing civilians whose insurgency they sought to contain. When these lithographs were exhibited in late 1918, which is, as you will know, I mean, it's right before the ending of the war. When they were exhibited in late 1918, a reviewer described them as, quote, brutal, full of horror, but reeking with truth, which adds to their poignancy. The artist's primary source of information was the Bryce Committee report, which had appeared in May 1915. Viscount James Bryce, former British ambassador to the United States and member of the International Court at The Hague, headed up a war crimes commission that took depositions from 1,200 wit eyewitnesses and studied the captured war diaries of German combatants to determine the truth of allegations against the occupiers. The 61-page report makes for excru excruciating reading all the more so because of the matter-of-fact manner in which it is written. Printed in 30 languages and sold in the United States for 10 cents a copy, the report was readily available and widely circulated. Less than a week after the sinking of the Lusitania, as reported here on the front page of the New York Times on May 8, 1915, that newspaper devoted three full pages to an abridgment of the Bryce Report. So what I'm saying is that everybody saw it. It was, it was so readily available. It doesn't take training in critical research methods to question its rigor. Names of witnesses are withheld in respect for their privacy, but without proper attribution, some of the more fantastic claims seem like hearsay or outright invention. After the war, the Bryce Report was subjected to scathing criticism, and it has ever since, and it has even been blamed for causing rumors of the Nazi mistreatment of Jews in the 1930s to be scoffed at as an exaggeration by those who wish to avoid. It caused those reports to be scoffed at as exaggerations by those who wish to avoid being duped again by government and news media propaganda. Nonetheless, contemporary scholarship indicates that despite its flaws and probable exaggerations, the Bryce Report was essentially accurate. The German occupiers did commit atrocities of the type and gravity described. At least seven of Bella's war lithographs show how he imagined crimes outlined in Bryce. Works of technical finesse and formal beauty with rich gradations of tone and dynamic compositions, they attract the eye but punish it for what it sees. One, Belgium farmyard depicts a dark outdoor setting where a German soldier pulling on his clothes stand, uh, stands over the supine body of a young female whom he has raped. In The Last Victim, three louche German soldiers in a middle-class parlor stare hungrily at a distraught young woman 
who has entered the room to discover her mother, father, and brother sprawled, dead, or dying on the floor. The corresponding passage in the Bryce Report declares, at Erv, some 50 men escaping from the burning houses were seized, taken outside the town, and shot. At Melun, a hamlet west of Erv, 40 men were shot. In one household alone, the father and mother, their names withheld, were shot. The daughter died after being repeatedly outraged, and the son was wounded. Now, these are among the more repertorial of Bellows' war lithographs. Others in the series seem downright phantasmagoric. The Bacchanal, for example, depicts German soldiers guzzling wine in the open space of a village while guards bring in a young mother whose hands are bound tightly behind her. A couple of small, naked children have been impaled on bayonets and are being waved in the air. But no one takes notice as if this were a common everyday occurrence. According to one of Bryce's unidentified witnesses, a drunken German soldier in the town of Malin, quote, drove his bayonet with both hands into a child's stomach, lifting the child into the air on his bayonet and carrying it away on his bayonet, he and his comrades still singing. Now here Bellows has combined two common themes in Northern Renaissance painting, the massacre of the innocents and the indifference of soldiers who torture holy martyrs. But he's updated the costumes and setting. And I'm giving you fair warning here. Some of the images that I'm going to proceed to show, you might want to avert your eyes and, or not. In Gottstrafe Angeland, God Punishes England, German soldiers nail captured British soldiers to doors made of rough wooden planks while a crowd looks on and jeers. Actually, I think they were Canadian soldiers. In the cigarette, a, solita a solitary soldier seated in the shadows on the far right of the image scowls while smoking. On the left, the corpse of a man sags in a window frame beneath a broken shutter. In the center, incandescently lit, a naked woman writhes in agony and shame. Her left arm, drenched in blood, extends high above her head, a spike driven through the palm to fasten her to the wall. A gaping hole where her left breast should be indicates that the smoker has torn it from her body. Bryce does not specifically describe this incident, but provides several accounts of sexual mutilation, as, for example, quote, two women were lying in the backyard of the house. One had her breasts cut off, the other had been stabbed, end quote. So I ask, could such nightmarish events really have occurred? Or was Bellows feverishly plunging into the depths of sadomasochistic fantasy? If not his own, then that of the collective unconscious, as it periodically bubbled up in the martyred saints' paintings of the old masters. As in here in uh, Sebastiano's Martyrdom of St. Agatha from 1519. As already mentioned, Goya's disasters of war etchings provided Bellows with the most compelling antecedent for his febrile imaginings of corporeal distress and dismemberment. That the Germans systematically committed atrocities against civilians cannot be disputed. In wartime, rape, pillage, and murder are common. But what about bayoneting babies, nailing prisoners to doors, and cutting off the breasts of women. Bellas believed, or allowed himself to believe, the worst of the enemy. He wanted to bear witness to the torture in killing, even though he had not seen these with his own eyes. It was an artist's responsibility, he insisted, to use the creative imagination to expose real-world crime and injustice, even when his knowledge of these was only secondhand. Reversing standard artistic practice, in which original paintings provide the source for lithographic copies, Bellows felt so strongly about the work that was pouring out of him in the, late, in the spring of 1918 that he set about turning five of his war lithographs into large and richly colored oil paintings. The barricade, composed in the manner of a neoclassical frieze, shows German, German troops firing from behind a human screen of naked civilians whose nudity symbolizes their utter vulnerability. 
So in other words, he maybe isn't saying they were literally naked when used as human screens, but they were used as human screens or human shields. The most disturbing of the five paintings, The Return of the Useless, alludes to the well-documented fact that the German occupiers had forced Belgian non-combatants into slave labor on the French front in Belgium and in Germany itself. When these prisoners became too weak and broken down to work productively, hence useless, their captors shipped them home in boxcars. Bathed in queasy red tones and theatrically lit, the painting shows a frightened young blonde woman faltering out of the shadows of a cattle car interior, which holds her sick and dying fellow passengers. To her left, our right, a German guard herds disheveled, bloodied prisoners, prisoners. And to her right, another guard stomps on a fallen young man and beats him with the butt of a rifle. It's difficult to look at this painting today without thinking of the Holocaust that lay ahead. Bellows may not have been an eyewitness to the sort of crime he depicts, but to judge from occurrences that became commonplace in Europe less than a generation later, he got the iconography of deportation just right. Of the five paintings he made from his war lithographs, the most acclaimed, despite Joseph Pinnell's disparaging remarks, was Edith Cavell. I would contend that it was, in fact, precisely because of the painting's lack of eyewitness authenticity that it made such a strong claim on the public imagination. Drawing on motifs borrowed from an array of sources, including old master religious art, contemporary recruitment posters, the Broadway stage, and the Hollywood melodrama, Bellows gave viewers a heightened sense of the reality of his scene, of the scene depicted by calling to mind other types of visual artifacts that already worked for them as conveyors of truth about the external world. Indeed, we might say that the painting privileges referential realism over eyewitness realism. By referential realism, I mean that it refers the viewer to other previously acquired data, visual and otherwise, providing a sense of familiarity and rightness, hence authenticity, to the scene depicted. The execution of Nurse Cavell was one of the most pub widely publicized stories of the Great War, and in death, Cavell became its iconic female victim. At the time of her arrest by the Germans in 1915, she was a 49-year-old English Red Cross nurse supervising a hospital in Belgium, in Brussels. The Germans accused her of secretly helping hundreds of wounded Allied prisoners to escape from Holland. She admitted to the charges against her, and the Germans sentenced her to death. Despite a worldwide outcry for clemency, a firing squad dispatched her at dawn. On the morning of October 12, 1915, Sir George Frampton's sculptural memorial to her in St. Martin's Square in London commemorates this date. Now, experts in international law agreed that the Germans were well within their legal rights to execute Nurse Cavell, who admitted to the crimes that she was charged with. But the wizards of British propaganda discerned a golden opportunity in the sentencing and made the most of it. At least 28 books and pamphlets about her were issued in the period, as well as commemorative coins and stamps and special illustrated press editions and license was made occasionally to envision her as a martyred young beauty. Now, Americans were, um, I'm going to skip a little bit. Given all the inflammatory propaganda that circulated in America about the death of Nurse Cavell, Bellas's depiction might have seemed especially real and authentic, particularly precisely because of its low-key, non-sensational manner. The artist chose, after all, to show the nurse neither dead nor dying, but rather in a quiet moment preceding execution. In other words, the depiction may have seemed real because it did not venture into the histrionic territory of previous images and des descriptions of the event. Instead, um, Bella shows Nurse Cavell radiant in white, stoically descending a prison staircase into a courtyard in which guards engage in nocturnal conversation or lose themselves in slumber. The subject calls to mind old master scenes of martyrdom and salvation, such as Raphael's deliverance of St. Peter from prison or Piero's resurrection with its sleeping guards.
and you know, I'm, these were two of the, I'm just going to, instead of reading, I'm just going to mention a few things here because my time is running out with all my Columbus references, and my, my, my technological faux pas. Uh, well, um, so these are two of the most popular posters of the American World War period, one showing a young, a pubescent child being led off by a German soldier with a Pickelhaub helmet while her village is in flames behind her. And it's clear the message is that he's going to rape this young child. And unless we remember Belgium by contributing funds, scenes of this kind of evilness will continue. And this was also a very famous poster showing a young mother and her child when the Lusitania sank, the sort of victims of the Lusitania sinking. So I'm arguing that nurse Edith Cavell is framed by these other kinds of more emotional, histrionic depictions of atrocities. So in reference to those, it seems very calm and neutral. And that's why many of Bella's supporters thought, it, and for many years, probably to this day, it still has this great reputation as being the best of his war paintings, perhaps because it's the least uh, over-dramatized. So I say uh, Edith Cavell is not nearly as direct as either of those posters in its appeal to the viewer's emotions, but because viewers came to it already having seen posters like these, which aroused their enmity against the Germans for desecrating female purity and innocence, the Bella's paintings could only have been seen by his contemporaries against the backdrop of those other far more inflammatory images. Figuratively, if not literally, it was framed by them. Now, I want to point out that the stairway that he uses is in his own studio. It was on 19th Street in New York, and he uses his wife Emma as, uh, I guess I don't know where the pointer is, but as the model for Edith Cavell. Gives her blonde hair, but she's the model. Um, if, okay. Thus we see that the war, um, that the war in Europe, which Bellas could only know secondhand, nonetheless resonated for him in a highly personal manner. Um, so I mean, he's associating it with his own home and his own children. Shortly after Bellows's untimely death in 1925, one of his champions excused the excesses of Bellows' war paintings by claiming that artists are, quote, able to visualize the atrocities more completely than most men and thereby suffered from a kind of indwelling excitement during the war that disturbed them to a point not yet admitted in print. So after war, Bellows' defenders are saying, well, yeah, he got over-exaggerated in his depictions of the war, but he was an artist, so he's more sensitive than most people. Bellows, the friend, explained, Bellows himself came to refer to his war paintings as his hallucinations, but he was not ashamed of having drawn and painted them. The return to the beginning of my talk, we need to ask ourselves, who was ultimately right? Joseph Pinnell, who faulted Bellows for making things up, even though he too did not, did so under the pressure of war, or Bellows, who claimed for himself a higher authenticity based on his empathetic response to atrocities he only read about but vividly imagined and made plastically real. By showing the horrors of war as perpetuated by the enemy on neutral civilians, Bellows served the cause of his government and its allies. But what the government was not allowed to see, what the public was not allowed to see, with some exceptions or even read about, were the horrors of war on the field of battle. Photos of the dead and dying were banned. The now conventional notion of the Great War as a four-year bloodbath did not take shape in American consciousness until after the war was over. That was a product of the mid to late 1920s. The depressing imagery of shrapnel shredded bodies, limbs torn asunder, dead men impaled on barbed wire, wounded men shrieking in agony, begging to be put out of their misery, and rats gnawing on gangrenous legs. All this came later. Post-war novelists such as John Das Passos, Thomas Boyd, Lawrence Stallings, and Ernest Hemingway, all of whom had witnessed the killing firsthand, either as combatants or as ambulance drivers, shattered any romantic illusions that may have lingered about battlefield glory. So too did a 
enormously popular anti-war movies such as The Big Parade from 1925 and All Quiet on the Western Front from 1932. All right, so I am going to just wrap this up here. Excuse me here. We're not going to talk about John Singer Sargent today. In 1918, with the war series, Bellows set aside his commitment to eyewitness realism because his greater goal was to shake Americans out of their moral lethargy and force them, as the title of a book by Susan Sontag puts it, to regard the pain of others. Sontag remarks of Goya's war etchings, quote, that the atrocities perpetuated by the French soldiers in Spain didn't happen exactly as pictured hardly disqualifies the disasters of war. Goya's images, she continues, Goya's images are a synthesis. They claim things like this happened, end quote. Bellow's images do the same. But does that justify them in his case? Rather than answer that directly, I'll end here with two famous quotations. One is from the British politician Arthur Ponsonby. Ponsonby who in 1928 published a diatribe against pop propaganda that he entitled Falsehood in Wartime. When war is declared, said Ponsonby, truth is the first casualty. To this he adds, there must have been more deliberate lying in the world from 1914 to 1918 than in any other period of the world's history. The other quotation, perhaps even more often repeated, is from Bellows's contemporary Pablo Picasso, who in 1923 observed, art is a lie that makes us realize the truth. As we have seen this afternoon, Bellows's war paintings and lithographs fall somewhere into the abyss that separates these two comments. Thank you. I can ask some questions if you need time to think of some. I was just wondering about Pinnell and his statement about um, personal experience as the platform, the appropriate platform for making art. Do you think that he excused himself from that? In a way, you're seeing he's being a hypocrite, but do you think he gives himself license to um, imagine that scene because it's for a popular poster and not for a painting or one of his etchings? Uh, Do you think it's the format that gives him license to, to diverge? I th that's a really good possibility. I mean, I, I was thinking with Suzanne, wherever Suzanne was sitting, when she was showing Pinnell during her talk, and he had a view of New York Harbor, and he probably would have prided himself as an etching how accurate that was. But you're right, um, it's something we've been talking about some this weekend is that illustrations and posters are seen of a completely different, they're a completely different animal than high art paintings, drawings, printmaking. And so for that very reason, as Randy suggested, perhaps that enabled, uh, you know, as Martin Berger was saying today, we all have our blind spots. It's inevitable. And that may have been one of the things that permitted him to have that blind spot that he could accuse his fellow artists of duplicity and not accuse himself. Thank you very much. I have a question, though, about the uh, relationship of the drawings and etchings to the paintings. It seems like s sometimes they followed each other in an order of etchings to paintings, and sometimes it went the other way. Uh, based on your experience, do you have any insight into that process of how he thought about things? And well, I, I think, as I, I mentioned, I think for him the normal progression would have been um, and, and for m most art of the time, it, it was the painting, and then somebody would convert it into an etching. Although, I mean, th in the history, I, I'm not sure with Winslow Homer, sometimes it went the other direction. Robert Conway can probably explain this to us much better. But I, I know in this case, Bella started off doing lithographs and then felt so impassioned about what he was showing that he said, I, I've got to move on to an oil painting. Do you? 
have some insights here about that. The, as you say, the normal procedure is that the, the, the print is a way to capitalize on the fame of a painting. And the notable example of Bellows doing that is Staggett Sharkey's, uh, and was very successful at it um, in selling it. But uh, you're right that in this case, um, the paintings are based on the lithographs. And, and typically, there isn't a consistent relationship between the drawings, the lithos, and the paintings. Bellows doesn't follow the normal rules or sequences that most other artists do. And I think he treated particularly the drawings as ends in themselves. Mm -hmm. They were not preparatory um, stages on the way to some final product. They were the final product. And the lithos are usually derivative from the drawings rather than the paintings. The war series is the exception to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Hi, I'm always interested in um, who I hear the who's voice, but I'm um, sure Bellows' from. clientels were. Like, were these war images sold to institutions for propaganda, or were they bought by, um, you know, private collectors? Because, you know, I don't know, I wouldn't want to put one of these in my home. So who were they marketed to, especially the war images? Yeah, well... So far as I can tell, and I, uh, Nanette, are you back there, Tony? Yes, um, Nanette has, has written something on, on the war images as um, the lithographs and their history. I think, didn't you? Did you? Very long time ago. Okay, so I won't call on you. Um, but my understanding is that he, as I was saying, I feel he was doing this out of a real conviction, out of passion. He did put them on display in an art gallery in, uh, on Fifth Avenue. And um, so they were seen, there were some reviews, but they weren't really widely distributed. I don't, distributed, I don't know, I don't remember the history of each individual painting. They mostly went into private collections. One went in, uh, to a collection in Greenville, South Carolina. They, so they weren't seen uh, widely in New York. The couple of the images, the less incendiary images, did appear in magazines um, right around the end of the war, sort of pro-American, but they were, the, they were not the hardcore, sort of disgusting images <laughs> that I was showing today. And the, the best known of the war paintings was the death of Edith Cavell, which somehow ended up in Worcester, Mass. And there, it was probably more seen there than the other ones, which were in private collections or down in the South. Kind of just ex explanatory, I guess, for, for those lithos that you showed that we're talking about. Um, uh, were you arguing that? Uh, Could you turn up her mic a little? Yeah. Bit? Can you hear me? Uh, were you yeah. arguing that it was just the br I'm looking here the Bryce report that inspired those images, or were there other sources? Was he reading the newspaper? Did you know? Were there other kind of rather histrionic? Um, reports of what was happening in Europe? I was just wondering about That's that. a great question. My looking through many newspapers of the period, I found that it's all toned down. There's no discussion of horrific events. There is, the other thing that was the biggest source for Bellows was, I think his name was Arthur Brand. He had been an American ambassador to Belgium. And he came back you know, right at the beginning of the war and he wrote up a, a, an account of things that he had seen, that he had witnessed in Belgium. And at one point, I think Bellas was commissioned to do some drawings for that. That was published in one of the periodicals of the time. Again, it wasn't nearly as severe as these more private, what I'm calling the febrile um, inner demon images. But so, so the, it's sort of like the previous answer. He worked in different ways, and, and he was getting the images out there, but in general, the public this is we always were hearing about the Holocaust in the, you know, that it took the, the clearing of the concentration camps for the American public to, to say, oh, this was really happening, we had no idea. Well, I think, aside from the Bryce report, people weren't getting the news of these kinds of things. D David, 
In, in the rhetoric of your talk, you place a lot of emphasis on the earlier ones based on observation and then this break that occurred. And I'm curious what your stake is in maintaining that separation. And I ask because, one, we know that Bellows created plenty of paintings that earlier that weren't based on observation, like New York upstairs that we talked about yesterday that's a composite. But more importantly, because your whole career has been based on showing how everything we see and represent is always already filtered through, through these various means. So I'm, I'm curious why you maintain that kind of bright line in the, in the logic of the talk. Oh, that's a tough question <laughs> from, from my dearest enemies. So, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I think you're completely right that I feel that realism, you know, I've always have a stake in deconstructing realism and showing that it's never some simple direct transfer from an external reality through the transparent eyeball of the artist on to the page or canvas. So I've never believed that, but what I have believed as I get older, I suppose, and I have been a teacher for a really long time and that I've argued with you about, but that I feel that when writers, whether they're writing a, a paper for school or they're writing a scholarly essay or writing a work of fiction, when there is like a really close intellectual engagement with some reality, I'll put reality in quotes, but whether it's an external reality or an internal reality that one senses and is trying to observe, that, that I think to me observation, close observation, is a really, I don't want to say transcendent virtue, but it's an important, it's a really important activity. And I think that Bellows, even if he was making things up earlier, he was certainly doing composites. The, the New York, as we were hearing yesterday, is a composite painting. But I know that he was spending hours upon hours upon hours sort of trying to understand how people move. And then he's not trying to, you know, mimetically be faithful exactly, but he's trying to, he's looking at a world that he decides that he's going to observe, and he's breaking it up into many little pieces and reconstructing it in his head. Anyway, there's a kind of follow through and engagement there that I do think is laudable and that I don't feel happened as much in the second part of his career. Argue back with me. Give me a little. I, I mean, I think part of my hesitation here is because I, you know, I don't ever want to indulge in any kind of cult of an artist or cult of a professor or cult of a novelist. You know, I think we all are amazingly flawed. And I'm not trying to say there was the good bellows and then the bad bellows or the, the great one and then the failed one. It is a life however short it may be, in his case, a life is a very complex, messy thing. And I'm just trying to sort of sort out different emphases that he went through. And I, I guess I find it really fascinating that at a certain point where he was so, I mean, my basic feeling, again, I've, it was just in my talk, but I'll just say it again, is I think he was a man who wanted to do good in the world, that he had a sort of progressive era notion that it was possible for an individual to change the world for the better. And he wanted to be, even if he did it in a sardonic, witty way normally, he wanted to bear witness to social inequities and, and social injustices. Well, then when he starts reading about the war, to him, the greatest social injustice extant in the world at that point is the war and what the Germans, he believes, are doing to innocent people. And so that so inflames him that he's willing to sort of diminish other parts of his creed for this, what he thinks is fidelity to fighting social injustice. So that, whether it's flawed or not, and I guess that was the whole point of my talk, if, if, if you want to hear what I think it was about, is that it's really, really tough for us when we read about things happening in Somalia we're happening in you know, some distant continent, and we're getting feedback in Syria. We're hearing about, in Tunisia, we're hearing about terrible things that are happening, and we want to make some difference. But how do we know that what we're hearing, you know, we hear there are weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, and we go, okay, I guess then we better you know, get the troops together and go over and invade that country. Well, that doesn't exactly work, and I think Bellows was really sucked down that rabbit hole. But on the other hand, it's not good to just sit back and do nothing. 
and there's no, and so I love the fact, I mean, I love Bella's for a lot of reasons, but I love the fact that he was really struggling with this issue and that it cost him some of his friendships. I think it cost him a lot of quality in his art, but I think his highest priority was to do the right thing. And I don't think he did the right thing, but I think he was struggling to do the right thing. Okay, so I have two questions, okay. and one is following really from what Martin just asked, because I too was intrigued by your investment in this contrast that you set up. Sorry, can you hear me now? Is that better? Okay, so I too is intrigued by that, um, that contrast you set up, and it strikes me even in your explanation now that somehow war as a subject um, Maybe it invites these kinds of questions. So at the end, when you ask, you know, if if this justifies the works, the idea of justifying the works is something that we wouldn't necessarily we wouldn't necessarily talk about other kinds of works in that way. And you know, I'm just reminded of scholarship on the Civil War and other wars and all these essays on why are these pictures so terrible and all of that. So um, I, I guess I. You've already sort of commented on that from a contemporary perspective, but I'll just say my hunch is that, I guess I wonder what would happen if this ends up being a small part of an argument that veers off into bigger questions. My feeling is that maybe this is taking you into a, a sort of cul-de-sac that, um, I, I don't know, I just, it, it sort of reminds me of working on commercial art and worrying about if it's worthy, you know? Like, so the idea of justifying the works and we value them in certain ways and maybe, I'm just, I, I just feel like maybe you, you'll go somewhere else with it. But my, my other well, question. Well, uh, let me respond to that okay, first one okay. before I forget what it was. Okay. <laughs> that, um, I mean, yeah, the whole notion of value, because this is something I talk about with my students a lot, that, and that I think about a lot. I'm not at all, as I said earlier, I'm not interested in having a pantheon of the great artists and the lesser artists and the moral artists and the immoral artists. That kind of stuff doesn't really interest me very much. But value or worth does interest me. I do want to know why should I, or why should I say to my audience or my students, care about this, care enough about it to look closely at it and spend time with it rather than just write it off. So it's not, I'm not trying to f f right some wrongs on the aesthetic scales where commercial illustration is considered better or worse or popular. You know, I write, one of my books is on Titanic and I was that, a lot of what that book is about is why is a movie that's so enormously popular so disdained by the critics? I mean, I'm always thinking about these issues and I guess my confession is I've never come up with an answer, but that for me is what writing and teaching and lecturing is about, is just posing questions and trying to, to get it out. It just feels like this material, it's like what makes a good war picture is part of what that's underlying some of your discussion, you know, as you're trying to help us to understand how, well, maybe drawing on Goya or maybe something more subdued and less propagandistic, less histrionic, whatever, somehow is a good war picture. So that's why I'm just raising that. Um, but my other, um, my other question, I guess, has to do with your idea of referential realism and uh, Martin's idea of truth. So I was thinking about these two ideas in relation. So f Martin, correct me if I'm wrong, but your idea of, of truth is that it's, it's a kind of truth that reinforces um, a homogeneous status quo kind of vision that doesn't actually attend to the truth of what's actually going on in terms of racial hierarchies and politics. And for you, referential realism, it seems like I wanna try to understand these concepts in relation, because for you, referential realism is something that somehow attains a truth based on its distance from an actual eyewitness lived experience, but has to do with reference points that are inherited. So I just, I mean, I don't have an answer to that, and I, I'm not sure it actually works, but I just wondered if you might be willing to think about that. Oh, well, I'm definitely willing to think about it. <laughs> but I would just say quickly here that, um, and then I, I misspoke if I tried to, again, set up a, um, a scale between experiential realism and referential realism. I just think that these are, that, that we have different ways of trying to understand the world. 
and make sense of the world. And one of the ways in which we think, and I guess it goes with Martin's idea, where we think something is authentic is not because it's authentic, but because it bounces off, it resonates with previous things. I mean, we're told, you know, Hitler called it the big lie. I mean, we're told something enough times, we believe it's true, and then something comes down the road and is congruent with what we've already heard. You know, the, the black people are this way and Irish people are that way. And if it fits in with what we've already been told for many years, then we tend to believe it's true. So that's what I meant by referential realism, that it's the Bellows's images are kind of already referring to a pre-established, the, the signifiers that are already out there in the culture. Mm -hmm. I'm going to just keep trying to think about these well, things together. Well, would Professor Berger yeah. care to? Very simplistically, don't we, uh, aren't we just talking about shared intelligence and how it messes with us? <laughs> Are you an eyewitness uh, to something and then someone else tells you about it and then how you're influenced by that information uh, be it to write a poem or to paint or do something. And there's always this issue about the authenticity based on our subjective feelings about this. Original ideas about shared intelligence. Um, yeah, or, or shared unintelligence. <laughs> um, yeah, th this again is this sort of coming at this another way is that I think that we live in Walter Lippmann, who was became a famous sort of conservative columnist, but during World War I, he was on the left, he was a liberal columnist, and he came out in 1922 with a book that was very influential called Public Opinion. And he's, the thesis of public opinion is that we now live in a society that is so complex and it's so vast that there's never any way you can know all the people in your community even and let alone people who live in other countries or live in other parts of New York City. And so he said, as society becomes more and more complex, we as individuals become more and more dependent on stereotypes. And he's the one who coined our modern use of the term stereotype. Before that, it was just used in the printer's trade. But he said, we need, and he, he wasn't approving of this, he just said, we become dependent on pre-existing notions of reality, that's the only way we're able to deal with things. And he said that's a very flawed method, but that's sort of the best we've got. So, uh, and I think we're in that position even more. So we can look at bloggers, but well, I mean, you all know this. I mean, I'm, I'm sure everybody here is, knows about how Google tracks has some sort of, um, what do you call it? Um, an, not aneurysm, <laughs> I forget what the word is. Algorithm, Algorithm. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, so if you tend to look up one type of thing, then when you put a question to Google, it knows if you're a lefty or if you're a conservative, and it's going to find information sources that are going to accord with your already existing belief patterns. And so then that just reinforces it, and we get further and further away from having any kind of dialogue. Do you want, did you want to? No, I just think it's an issue we all have to deal with, and uh, I, I, I thought perhaps I'm bringing it to a more simplistic term, but because I deal with it all the time myself. <laughs> in, what, in what sense, and how? Well, uh, just trying to decide um, the authenticity of a reaction that I'm having versus what it might really be the facts, and try to sort that out to be as much a... a a person who cares about trying to fall on the most informed way of thinking about things so that it's coming from a pureness that I've tried to, to achieve anyway. Yeah. And uh, now, well, I would just say just that I think it is one of the most toxic issues in our society right now is our inability to listen to anybody outside our own you know, belief community. Thank you. Thank you.